Investing in dividend growth stocks is very popular here in the United States, but it's also popular in other parts of the world like Europe. Watch this video to learn about 22 extremely high quality dividend growth stocks that you can buy in the European markets. Hello everybody, this is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of Fast Graphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer Software Tool, aka Mr. Valuation. I've got a very special video today. We're going to look at some European dividend growth stocks. I had um, the real good pleasure and privilege to be invited to speak on a podcast for the European Dividend Growth Investor. Their podcast is entitled Dividend Talk, and it was host Derek, and I wish I knew how to pronounce his name, but Edgy from the Netherlands run this podcast, and they were gracious enough to invite and have an interview. So those of you who have been following my work might want to take the time to look at it. We're going to put a link at the bottom of this video. But they also have a YouTube channel called the European Dividend Growth Stock Investor. And as a lot of you know, recently Fast Graphs launched a European or international version of Fast Graphs. And, you know, like everybody else, I didn't really know a lot about investing in European stocks. And I didn't really know, you know, what European stocks I should be investing in. So I learned a great deal from working with the European Dividend Growth Investor in their the Dividend Talk podcast, because first thing they did was they provided me with a list of 22 of the premier blue chip dividend growth stocks in Europe. And, you know, a lot of these names we'll know, and some of these names we won't know. But I do want to go over some things about this list, and I'm going to go through it very, very quickly, just as an introduction. I'm still, you know, in the process of doing my own deep due diligence and research on some of these, and mainly because of the learning experience it's giving me. But the first thing I want to do is I want to point out that all of these stocks pay a dividend, number one. Some of them pay a very nice dividend, excess of 3%. But let's talk about also about valuation, because I think that's very important. There are 22 stocks on this list. If I use my portfolio function in Fast Graphs here and put them in order by earnings yield, I want you to notice there are only six that have an earnings yield really above 6%, actually seven if you want to include Siemens. But these are the six that are fairly valued. We're going to be talking about these six companies that are fairly valued in the European sector here at, at great length. But I do want to go through these 20 stocks on the European. And then I have a special treat for you later, because since these are dividend growth stocks, I've invited Professor Nathan Mock to come in, who's a specialist in value investing, which is obviously why he's near and dear to my heart. But he's also uh, written several papers and done a lot of work on the safety of dividends and value investing as well. So he's going to come in here and talk about the safety of the six dividend stocks on this list that are fairly valued. But I'm going to put this in alphabetical order, and I'm just going to go through them here very quickly and point out some attributes here that I found very intriguing about these companies. Now, valuation price is one thing. So I'm going to take price off of the graph here, and I'm going to take the normal PE off, which is also related to price. And what I want to do is first just kind of go through these companies and look at them from a standpoint of, you know, what type of growth, what type of operating performance they have historically achieved. Now, I also want to introduce a very important feature of FastGraph to those of you who have the international version. If you go to the gearbox up here to the right section and go into currency and put auto down and make sure you save your changes if you do that, what you'll do then when, when you look at stocks on the international market, it will auto or any stock, including stocks on the U.S. market, it'll automatically put in the currency of origin of the company. Here we're looking at euro. And by the way, I'm going to butcher the names of these stocks. You know, Dale Hayes, you know, Con Klickajicki. I, you know, I'm, I, I have to apologize to my German friends. I don't really have a good handle on pronouncing these names. And uh, as you'll notice later in the video, uh, Nathan Mock doesn't mention my name too much either. But that's something we're all learning to do. But what you're seeing here is the company paying a dividend, which is the white line on the fast graph. The orange line, of course, is the valuation reference line. And for most of these stocks, it'll be a PE ratio of 15 like normal. And just again, to refresh those of you who aren't real familiar with our fast graph tool, if the price is above the orange line, that would indicate areas of very high valuation and even overvaluation. If it's touching the orange line, that would indicate a valuation that is very sound, even with a built-in margin of safety. And then, of course, if it's below that, then it would be very attractive entry points as long as the fundamentals keep growing. Now, also, you're looking at the dividend growth here. And the reason it's important to look at these in the currency of their origin is because that eliminates any of the complexities and the nuances and the nuisances, even, if you will, 
of trying to check with exchange rates because if I put this in U.S. currencies, sometimes you would see it looks like dividends are being cut and they're not. You know, they weren't cutting the currency. It was only because there was something going on with the exchange rate at the time that dividend was reported. But what I want you to note here is the consistency of the company. Now, this particular firm started paying their dividend in 07. You can clearly see that on FastGraph. And they've increased their dividend steadily. They did pay a special dividend. Um, so this is not really a dividend cut, in my opinion. But they've had a very good dividend growth record and a very consistent earnings growth record. And I'm going to go through all of these very quickly with you. Air Liquid here started paying a dividend in 03. They've consistently increased their dividend every year. They have a very consistent earnings growth rate of over 7%. And once again, we're looking at a 15 fair value multiple. The next one on the list here is Allianz. And Allianz is a multi-line insurance company in Germany. I'm going to eliminate a couple of things here to try to get a little better handle. It's not a very fast grower, I want you to notice, but it does have a very good dividend record of you know raising the dividends and it has a 4.66% yield. But again, this one has more cyclicality than some of the others that I like a little better, but it is double A rated, but it does have 53% debt. The next one we're going to look at here is AMBRA and AMBRA you know, did go through the Great Recession with some stress. They did maintain their dividend, however, until they finally were forced to cut it in 2010. And this, this this company has a June fiscal year, I want you to notice. But once they stabilized, then they've you know had a really good dividend record ever since, including through COVID. They maintained their dividend. They didn't cut it and they didn't grow it, but they maintained it. Um, and again, you see a very consistent growth rate. So if I shorten the time frame here, you know, you see a double digit grower that's been very attractive since coming out of the Great Recession, not COVID, the Great Recession. I misspoke earlier. The next one is ASML here. Let's go ahead to the max graph. Once again, we see going through the Great Recession, some, you know, some issues. We did see a little bit of dividend stress during COVID. Once again, very consistent, very fast growth on the long term and over 22%. So here we're using a PE of 22, just so you're, you're familiar. If I shorten the time frame, now we're using a PE of 17.91. When it's over 15% growth, we use the P equals growth rate. The next company on the list is Asa Abloy. I think that's pronounced. We can see a nice consistent growth rate here, um, even through the Great Recession. It did have a little bit of an earnings hiccup during COVID, but it was still very, very profitable. When you see a drop like this, I also want to point out that the company is still very profitable. So this is a very excellent looking company. A minus rated, has very moderate debt, and it's in building products. You know, we can look at some of those things. You, I'm going to let you do it yourself now. British American Tobacco is an interesting one because I want to use this. First of all, we see very nice, consistent growth at 8%. We see a very consistent dividend record, you know, since they've, you know, been paying a dividend. But I want, I do want to do something here for you to show you. I want you to focus on this dividend record and see how consistent it was with this one special dividend being paid in 2017. But if I go here to the currency section, and I switch to the U.S. dollar and I save my change, I want you to notice it looks like there were several dividend cuts or at least a couple of dividend cuts along the way. That, again, is the problem with you know, evaluating some of these stocks when you have a currency exchange rate. From a standpoint of understanding the business, I do think it makes more sense to look at these companies in their country of origin. And again, here we got the, you know, the, the British pound is what we're looking at with British American tobacco, but a very consistent dividend record in its currency of origin. Moving on real quick, Diego PLC, which is a vintners and distillers. Again, a little bit of cyclicality and earnings. Decent growth at 5% of just a really great dividend record, current yield 2.83%. I'm going to get into that a little more as I go through these. Here's a very, very fast-growing company in casinos and gaming. I mean, it's one that's very interesting. It does offer very minimal dividend yield because of the fact that it's, you know, got such a high dollar stock price in their Swedish currency of, you know, this over 1300 So it's, you know, it's expensive, but it does have a very modest dividend yield. But this is one that is considered popular dividend, European dividend growth stock. Resenius, I think it's pronounced as a healthcare company. And like others, you know, they've had some issues, especially coming through COVID but they have, again, a very excellent dividend record, very modest levels of debt. They're just, you know, just short of being a triple B plus or A rated company. So financially, they look very strong. They've got a good long-term dividend record. Next, we want to go through Halma PLC. Again, I want you to focus on the consistency of the growth at 11%. Once again, I'm using a 15 PE ratio. 
and a dividend yield of about 0.95%. I'm not focusing on dividend yields quite yet. Here's an apparel retailer in Spain. They did struggle during COVID like a lot of retail companies did, but they came out and they're recovering very nicely, and they've reinstituted their dividend and began growing it again very quickly. So these are some interesting-looking international or European dividend growth stocks. Here's um, Kering, which is apparel luxuries and luxury goods. It has had a special dividend that it paid in 2012, and you know they've had other special dividends they've paid along the way, it looks like. But it did you know struggle a little bit again, which is understandable during COVID, but otherwise they've got a Pretty good record of 7.66% growth with some cyclicality in the way. The next stock we're going to look at is, um, you know, Louis Vuitton, you know, LVMH, I think it's called now. Moet Hennessy, Louis Vuitton. Um, again, because it's in the uh, apparel industry, you know, it did have a little struggle during COVID, but it went through the Great Recession pretty well with only a mild hiccup in earnings. A real good dividend record. They did cut their dividend a little bit during COVID, but they've reinstituted it, or, you know, back the next one we're going to look at is Nestle. It's the one we're probably more familiar with in the U.S. You know, not a real fast grower, but a consistent grower. We do have a very nice dividend yield on it and a company that's increased their dividend. So these are dividend growth stocks, European dividend growth stocks that, you know, look like they stand up very well to some of the blue chip dividend growth stocks that you find on the U.S. or the New York Stock Exchange or the U.S. stock markets. Novartis, you know, is very interesting. 5% grower, consistent dividend record well-known pharmaceutical company out of Switzerland. Then, of course, this is Novo Nordisk. This is the semi-glutide industry. We'll look at that a little bit later. Much faster growth recently than historically, even if I use my scroll bar here. You know, we got 18% growth there. You know, it's down to 16% here, but still got really good growth. But I do want you to know that the growth rate has really accelerated in these years. Very low dividend yield and very low earnings yield. I want to point that out. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And L'Oreal, another one, double A rated, very low debt, consistent grower, consistent dividend record. These are the kinds of stocks that dividend growth investors, I think, should focus on because one of the key attributes of dividend growth investing is you want to be, you know, as consistent and reliable with the dividend coming up. And again, Professor Mock is going to come and talk about the dividend safety of the six companies on this list that are currently fairly valued, and we'll get into that. Here's Hermes International. We've had an acceleration of growth recently, therefore a very low earnings yield and low dividend yield. That would indicate that the price is high. Here's Siemens AG, another very good-looking double-A rated 41% debt, somewhat semi-cyclical. It's an industrial conglomerate, which again is not unusual for that. Then we've got Unilever here, which is personal care products. And, you know, Unilever is very similar to like a Procter & Gamble on the U.S. Decent growth, but, you know, modest growth, I should say. Not, you know, it, it's consistent with some cyclicality. Um, and there are some times where they have very low growth, but they got a very consistent dividend record. And they do offer a 3.72% yield currently. And then last on the list is Walters Kluwer, I think it's pronounced. Research and consulting services, very, very consistent growth rate and consistent dividend record. Now, here's where it gets interesting. I'm going to breeze through these very quickly. I'm going to bring price into the equation now, and I'm going to add the normal PE so we can see that. What I want you to note here is that this company has you know left its normal fair valuation or undervaluation. There was a time you could have bought this stock at a 10 multiple, now trades at a 31 multiple. That's why the dividend yield is so low, because the price is so high, and also why the earnings yield is so low, is because the price is high. Now, when a company's considering you know producing this kind of growth, it's not unusual to see the market get enamored with that and grow. And what you're doing here, you could obviously make money paying for you know, overpaying for this stock and during these periods of time. But the point is, from a value investor's perspective, you're taking a much greater amount of risk than you would have been taking had you bought it, you know, back here or even right here when it was fairly valued trading at around a 15 PE ratio. All right. So, you know, your your rate of return is going to be enhanced, even though, you know, the stock has been, you know, just carrying a high value. So that's a very high valued one. We go to Unilever. It's trading below its normal PE but again, you can see that high valuation led to very poor performance for several years, you know, less than 2% annualized rate of return, including dividends. And that's simply because the stock was overvalued. So I want you to be aware of that. As we go through here, you know, we see Siemens is slightly overvalued right now. But again, you can see how the price and earnings correlate very closely with each other over time. Here's Hermes International. 
very, very highly valued right now, but it's been a great stock. It's been a great performer. It's, you know, paid some special dividends along the way, it looks like. So that's a very interesting one. But again, a very high valuation. Earnings yield is less than 2%, let alone the dividend yield being less than 1%. Next one here on the list is L'Oreal. And L'Oreal has normally traded at a high multiple, you know, given a quality premium double A rated with only 16% debt. But it's gotten way excessively above that. It's trading at a 35 multiple, 2.8% earnings yield, but it does offer a 1.5% dividend yield. But again, I don't think this is a great entry point for names like this. I think the great entry points would have been when you could have bought it below the blue line and even better yet for that very short time in 08 and 09 when you could have bought it, you know, literally at a 15 multiple as its growth would indicate it it ought to be trading at. Um, here's Novo Nordisk. Now, I mentioned this is the semi-glutide um, situation. With Fast Graphs, you can always go to the company's corporate website and, you know, look up um, what the company does. And we're going to go through here and look at their products. And we're going to look at their medicines. And, you know, one of the you know, the big medicines originally to fight di- diabetes and now fight obesity would be the Wagovi or the semi-glutide it's referred to as. So what you've got here is a stock that's really hot on the investor's mind, but I want you to use your common sense. Common sense would just by telling you, by looking at that picture, this would not be a good time to buy it. And had you bought it when it was fairly valued, I think you have decisions to make now. What should you do now? Because you've got a very low dividend yield and very low earnings yield on a double A rated company with low debt, but it's in a hot market that's been growing, you know, rapidly. So you know, is now the time to buy the stock or is now the time to sell the stock? That's a decision investors have to make for themselves, but you should make it at least with that knowledge. Novartis, on the other hand, is also a double A rated with low debt, much lower growing company, trading at a reasonable valuation with almost a, you know, 4% dividend yield. So going on down, you know, through the list here, we got Nestle. You can see the effects of valuation, how Nestle's come back to its normal 19-ish multiple you know, the market likes to give a premium multiple to blue chips like that. So now would be maybe a sensible time to buy Nestle. Back here when the stock was trading closer to the orange lines would have been excellent times to buy Nestle. I just want to make that clear. You know, going down the line, here's Louis Vuitton again. You could see how it always traded at a nice 15 multiple. But now we've had this, you know, coming out of COVID, it's had some good earnings years and good earnings reports. And the market is now pricing it at an earnings yield less than 4% with a P.E. of over 26. I think that's too expensive to be buying the stock here today. And Kering looks fairly, you know, fairly valued right now. This is one of the fairly valued ones we'll talk about. Industria di Deceno Textile Company. It's apparel retail, as I mentioned earlier. I consider it overvalued now, but it has historically traded at a very high valuation. It does only have 17% debt, but no credit rating. And going up the line here, very quickly, we can see how very high valuation has already begun to have an impact on Halma PLC, which which is electronic equipment, but it has very, very low debt, no credit rating. Moving on here, we're going to go to the freshness, I think it's pronounced. You can see high valuation. Earnings began to weaken. The stock price reacted great dramatically, but now it looks like the earnings are beginning to grow again, and the stock is very inexpensive. We'll cover that. Here's Evolution, the casino and gaming company, with very high growth rates, but I do want you to note that their growth is slowing down a little bit as you shorten the time frame, which is something you should always do with fast graphs. And going through, we got Diego, the distiller, and you can see, again, the effect high valuation had. But the market does put a premium valuation on this stock quite often, but there are times when you could buy it at really attractive valuations. It has been dropping here more recently. It's A-rated with 61% debt. Then British American Tobacco has, you know, really the growth rate has slowed down. If you shorten this to eight years, you'll see that we're down to about a 4% growth rate, which I think explains the low valuation, but it does have a very low valuation, almost a 10% dividend yield and a 15% earnings yield. And it is triple B plus with, you know, very little debt. So this is one that for the high yield investor, you might want to consider. And then this Asa Abloy is an A-rated, very low debt company in building products, but again, trading at a very high valuation current. We look at ASML Holdings, we see a very, very high valuation on a company that historically has traded better. It's got a very strong growth rate. We're using a 22 multiple as the fair valuation reference line, but the stock is currently trading at a 43 multiple. 
and because of that offers very little in the way of dividend. Ambra has you know been normally trading at a discounted valuation. It's a distiller. 10 multiple is more normal, so it's trading a little bit above that, but it still has a very high earnings yield and a very nice dividend yield. And it's not crazy overvalued like some of them. Allianz, you know, the more cyclical one has always traded at around a 10 multiple. Well, that's where it's trading at. You know, what you can say about this stock is it's got decent valuation. And then Air Liquid, as you can see, it's gotten very highly valued. And then, you know, we look here and go on to the first one we looked at and we see a very nice valuation of over a 4% dividend yield. So looking at all these stocks through that lens, that brings us to the six stocks that are at fair value. All these stocks, if you look at the P.E. ratio, they're trading at, you know, below 15 for ex except for caring. They have earnings yields that are attractive except for caring. Caring has gone up in value here since I originally started looking at this list. But what I'm going to do here, we're going to go through these companies. Again, I've asked Professor Mock to go through and look at the dividend safety because these are six that can be bought and attract. They're not only good dividend growth stocks, but they're trading at good valuations currently. And what we want to look at is how the valuations stack up. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Mock at this point and let him show you or go through some of the methods he uses to check for dividend safety. Take a quick look at the dividend safety of these six European firms. And just to start, uh, as I think about dividend safety influenced uh, by some research I've done and, and published on this topic, which tries to look at the factors that lead to firms cutting dividends. And uh, this particular paper was focusing on the impact of the pandemic. And, you know, if we look at the financial crisis and the pandemic, uh, you know, macro events that affect firms pretty systematically tend to be big drivers of cuts, but they're also firm specific factors. And a couple of the things that I really like to zoom in on are really their earnings slash cash flow and then just their cash on hand. So the cash on hand allows them to have some insulation against sort of one time bad events. They can kind of carry on paying dividends and not really need to readjust. And then if they have stable earnings, stable cash flow, that's more than enough to meet their dividend payout needs tends to be relatively safe from cuts barring some sort of you know new event that happens. So uh, let's jump right in then to the financials. And so uh, the first thing that I would do is go to the financial statements, the cash flow statement, take a look at the net income, which is the, the top line, which we start adjusting from. And first of all, what I just see in net income for this firm is stable, you know, generally growing over time, but a, a, a stable number. Yeah, you know, it's about two and a half billion euros as of the uh, most recent year reported here. There's some adjustments. So adding back depreciation and amortization to get to an operating cash flow. And then we would take out maybe something like a capital expenditure, which is about two and a half billion. So, you know, the net of all of those is probably in that two and a half to three billion dollar range. If we go down to the cash flow from financing, we'll see that they paid out 979 million euro in uh, dividends. And uh, while certainly that's a, you know, large value compared to the net income and the cash flow, sort of a, a reasonable level there and no red flags there. Also, if we hop over to the balance sheet and we look at cash and short-term investments or even just cash only of, you know, $3 billion, um, you know, making a little less than a million dollar dividend payment with $3 billion in cash and the type of capital expenditures that they need and the cash flow they generate. I don't see any real uh, red flags there. So just, you know, repeating the same thing for each firm here. Hop into the cash flow statement, and what we see are again, you know, a funds from operations, a top line that's stable and positive. Uh, we get some sense of capex, the scale of the capex. We look at the the dividends paid. In this case, paying you know more like four billion a year uh, recently in euros, and when we compare this to you know, sort of overall operating cash flow of, you know, one billion in the most recent period, that might be a little bit alarming. However, if you look back in history, this looks like it was due to a change in working capital. If you work, look back at net operating cash flow, it's been more in the 20 plus billion dollars. So comparing that to, you know, dividend paid of uh, four, uh, four billion, certainly within reason usually, the 2022 fiscal year, a little bit of a blip. And then if you look at the cash on hands, 
a cash on hand of $22 billion. You know, certainly that's a, a big number and uh, seems to sync pretty well with the amount of dividends they're paying. Overall looks good there. 2022 may be a, a little bit of a concern just based on cash flow, but seems to be due to just a kind of a one-time change in working capital. Here we see uh, 29 million as the dividend uh, amount in common dividends. If we go up to net income of 94 million, or if we look at an operating cash flow of 62 million, if we compare that maybe to they need 30 million for CapEx, They've got enough net income, enough operating cash flow certainly to cover the, the dividend. Hopping over to the balance sheet, we see about $27 million cash on hand. And again, comparing that to um, what they're paying out in dividends of about $29 million. This one a little bit tighter. You know, they're a little bit closer to you know, just kind of meeting that. And, uh, but they've got about double the, the cash flow and about triple the net income of what they pay out in, in dividends. So a little bit of a higher payout ratio and not quite as much cash. So, you know, of the ones we've looked at so far, maybe a dividend a little more at risk than the other two, but still not really in the, the major red flag zone. Moving on to British American Tobacco. The uh, dividends paid here, about five billion. Comparing that to a loss in 2023, which was a bit of an anomaly, had been uh, positive operating cash flow was still you know positive of about 9 billion not a lot of spending on capital expenditures on capex so you know typically we've seen here uh, cash flows since 2018 of you know 8 billion plus and uh, net income of I mean about 6 billion plus until we had this loss so historically pretty uh, stable there, but recently the negative net income is a bit of a concern. When firms uh, lose money, especially if they expect to continue to lose money, sometimes uh, an option can be to reduce a dividend or at least in a minimum not grow the dividend. Uh, if we look at cash on hand of about $5 billion, that's up a little bit and overall um, they tend to keep quite a bit of cash on hand. That's about you know roughly equal to the amount of the dividend. So it does give them some ability to absorb, you know, some losses and still continue paying dividends. But yeah, the, the thing here that uh, certainly I would see that I would want to look more into is what was going on with uh, the negative, the negative net income. Okay, moving on here, we see this firm pays dividends of 890 million. That is on, you know, income of about 2 billion operating cash flows of, you know, four or 5 billion here recently spending about three billion on capital expenditures. So, you know, they need a lot of the, the cash that they generate to invest in CapEx. So it's certainly something uh, that, that we'd keep in mind. But again, with these operating cash flows of, you know, four plus billion recently compared to under one billion that they're paying out and taking a look at the cash on hand of, you know, closer to three billion here recently, it seems like the dividend in uh, you know relatively uh, safe shape just based on you know looking at these kind of high level you know, these high level financials. The final firm will take look at paying out dividends of about 1.7 billion euro. That's on net income of about three billion, operating cash flow of over four, and capex of about 2.6 billion. So again here uh, operating cash flow and net income compared to the to the dividend you know they're paying out a lot a fairly high percent but they certainly have enough operating cash flow and net income to cover when you factor in what they need for capex it's a pretty big number they had uh, some acquisition uh, activity uh, but it also looks like 23 was kind of a big year on capex so maybe a little bit of an outlier there and then also this is a firm that keeps quite a bit of cash on hand so again maybe a little bit higher on the payout ratio but just looking at their net income very stable increasing cash flow very stable increasing seems to be good so just to kind of wrap it up you know in general where do i go to to kind of check dividend safety just quickly to look for flags really you know earning stability cash flow stability 
that they generate enough earnings, enough cash flow to more than meet the dividend, meaning you know they're generating a greater value. And then also the cash on hand. Cash uh, really uh, serves to give a firm flexibility. So if they have a random event, some risk uh, comes to uh, the forefront and they have to deal with it, the cash on hand allows them to absorb that and not necessarily change their payout policy. All right, thank you, Nathan. This is Chuck again, back. I appreciate that, that was excellent. Looking at the dividend safety of these companies, you know, I think these companies are all attractive. You can see the valuations are low. If I go into the forecasting calculators here for each of these, I do want to talk about how this calculator works a little bit. This is really a discounted cash flow analysis, if you will. What we're doing is using the growth rate of the company, the estimated growth rate of the company as your discount rate. And then what we're doing is we're seeing what fair value would be. Well, fair value would be for Klondike would be somewhere up here around 30, between 37, around $37. The stock currently trades at $26. It's below the orange line, if you will. So if I simply go out here to the end and point to this, this would mean I've got an opportunity to get capital appreciation, the stock price going from 26 to if it traded at a 15 PE at this level of earnings in 2026, that would give me a 68% total return, if you will, growth, and annualized at 19.87, plus I would get just under $1,400 in dividends in euros, and that would give me an annualized rate of return of 23.2%. That return is a function of the price going from 26 to 45 or 44.8. That's also a fact of getting a dividend yield that's over 4% that's being paid for each year, and that's also getting PE ratio expansion from the current PE of 10.7 to the opportunity of 15. So that's how these rates of returns are calculated. This is really a, a discounted cash flow because discounted cash flow is all about measuring the stream, future stream of income and then coming back and saying, you know, what would be a fair value? Where fair value would be the orange line. Okay, so here you're buying it at a discount to fair value, which instead of earning 6.58% growth, plus you know a 4% growing dividend each year, you also get then the added benefit of the PE ratio expanding by almost a third, you know, or 50%, you could look at it, from a 10 PE to a 15 PE. All right, going on through this stocks, looking at Allianz, we got the same situation, about a 5% growth rate, 4.66% dividend yield. You know, we've got a stock that can give us a 22% annualized rate of return, assuming the earnings come in as expected. And, you know, we're looking at PE ratio expansion again from 10 to 15 by looking at plus dividend plus growth or capital appreciation. Looking at AMBRA, we've got a 12 multiple, we've got a 7% growth rate. You know, we're looking at a 19% annualized rate of return, assuming these earnings manifest and the stock ends up growing, ends up you know, selling at a 15 multiple. Now, the normal multiple has been much lower, so we could also want to make sure that we understand that looking at this stock that has a normal PE much lower, and you should do that with all of these stocks. I'm skipping that just for sake of brevity for this video, but you should always do that when you're using fast graphs. Use everything at your advantage. You know, same with British American Tobacco. This could be an extraordinary investment with a very high current dividend yield. If I look at a normal multiple of eight, it's still over 22%. And that's the five-year normal multiple. So it's been trading at a discount for the recent years. You know, going on, if I look at this healthcare company here, we're seeing double-digit growth expectations. We're seeing the possibility to earn over 35% a year annualized. That's 127% growth over the next three years, an average rate of return of 33%, plus a very nice dividend that's currently, you know, yield today would be 3.53%. Moving on, looking at Caring. Caring is trading on the upper end of its fair value, and these four orange lines would all indicate fair value. So it's above the mid-range of fair value. And that would give us the opportunity to make about a 7% rate of return, assuming it you know, reduced to a 15 PE. If it traded at around the 16 PE, like it currently is, then we would be looking at a rate of return, you know, a double-digit rate of return of about 10%, 10.13%. Again, looking at the normal multiple, this has a high normal multiple. We'd be looking at 18%. These are what-if situations that you should be utilizing to calculate 
what your possible rate of returns would be. Uh, anyway, this is Chuck Carnival. I do want to give a shout out once again to the Dividend Talk. I've got a link to this interview with me on there, and I want to thank them for inviting me once again. I also want to you know, give a shout out to their YouTube site because they talk about European stocks. I'm learning a lot from them. I think you would too. But anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of Fastgrass, bringing you this insight into some dividend really high quality blue chip dividend growth stocks. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give me a like, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also take a look at subscribing to Fast Graphs. You know, we've got over 80,000 stocks that you can evaluate, including all these European stocks that I covered in today's video. Once again, thanks for watching. Um, we'll be talking, I want to thank Nathan Mock for his excellent work on, you know, showing the dividend safety of the six companies that I considered fairly valued in the European market. All 22 were excellent candidates in my, in my opinion, but I do like to buy stocks when they're fairly valued. I hope you do too. Thanks for watching.